This is The Speaking Show. I'm David Newman, and you're tuned in to the number one podcast for speakers, consultants, and experts who want to speak more profitably. Stephanie Chandler, you're on The Speaking Show. Welcome, my friend. So good to be here with you. So the excitement never stops. It never stops with you. You're always up to like 17 different things. <laughs> and uh, nonfiction book publishing is your big thing. How did that become your thing? I think you spent some time owning a bookstore or being a bookstore consultant, and then you did marketing. And give us the whole backstory. <laughs> how, how do we end up in this crazy place where we are today? You know, I love that question. Quit my soul-sucking Silicon Valley job back in 2003, opened a brick-and-mortar bookstore, thought I was going to sit in the back office and write novels. Turned out I lacked the imagination to write fiction, but all my Silicon Valley friends were saying, I want to quit my job. I want to do what you did. And they kind of inspired my first book. It was a business startup guide. I needed a platform. I started building an online website. I had a bunch of traffic. And then a year later, I pitched a book to Wiley. I got my first book deal that was from entrepreneur to infopreneur. And that kind of exploded this whole new career I hadn't planned on. So I was speaking, consulting. I hated running a bookstore. It is not as romantic as it sounds. And uh, so I sold that store a few years later and just fell in love with nonfiction. I started my own hybrid publishing company, Authority Publishing, back in 08. In 2010, I decided I was speaking at all these writers' conferences and nobody was talking to us nonfiction writers. It was all about the fiction and the children's books. And we have different goals, right? So I launched a nonfiction writers conference online. I had no idea if anyone would come, but they did. And we continued it each year and people kept saying, how do we keep in touch when this event is over? So the Nonfiction Authors Association was born in 2013 as a result of that. And our communities like exploded. We have over 17,000 members. We've had amazing guest speakers at our conference. We had uh, Seth Godin last year, Gretchen Rubin, Guy Kawasaki. I mean, what an amazing ride. Who would have thought the uh, you know software salesperson who quit her job to open a bookstore would end up leading a nonfiction writing community? It's awesome. So thank you for that whirlwind tour. Holy smokes. Are you saying you've got 17,000 members in the Nonfiction Authors Association? We sure do. We sure do. That's I'm as shocked as you are, David. I'm telling you. I mean, and you know, I mean, I'd be totally open here. I launched that association in May of 2013. Five months later, my husband died, right? So I kind of checked out for a year. I had my head buried in the sand and the community grew despite the fact that I had one toe in the water. So when I finally got my bearings back, you know, it's taken off because there was a need. That's the thing. There was a need for this because all the other writers' organizations are very broad and they focus on fiction. They treat fiction as the golden child when in fact, nonfiction books sell more copies every year than fiction. It blows my mind that nobody was addressing this need before I came along. Totally incredible. And remind me how the Nonfiction Authors Association membership dues work and what they get and all that good stuff. Yeah, super great question. We have multiple levels of membership. The basic, what we call authority membership is $190 a year. You get access to recordings. We have a weekly teleseminar series. We release fresh content every week, templates, checklists, worksheets. One of our really popular benefits is the weekly homework that we send out. These are just a quick marketing tip every week. Like give you one thing to focus on for the week. Like maybe it's update your speaker page on your website or it's, you know, pitch a podcaster like you to be a guest. So these, you know, small bite-sized pieces, we've got discounts on, we have a, a year-round book awards program. Our nonfiction writers conference events now happen twice a year. We've got partner discounts. So Ingram Spark gives you free files set up. And then we also have what we call a VIP membership. That's about 500 bucks a year. That includes free access to both writers conference events in November and May. So it's got some additional benefits, but yeah, there's some great content. My favorite feature, by the way, right now is our private Facebook group because the conversations there are amazing. People are sharing their own experiences. They're asking interesting questions. You know, we're having some healthy debates about publishing and self-publishing and traditional publishing. So it is such a cool community. I love being part of it because it's full of really smart people who want to make a difference in the world. 
Totally incredible. I want to go back to the foundation of that in a second, but I'm just, <laughs> I can't help. And I think our listeners are also like doing this math in their heads. Yeah. This association is now a seven figure business for you. Well, let me clarify that. We do have a free member level. So you can join okay. at a free level. It gets you into the live teleseminars. So, you know, truthfully, the mass majority are at the free level, but we absolutely have the subscribing members who are getting the bulk of the benefits. As gotcha. Well. Okay. So let's go back to the foundation of that. Because listen, 17,000 free, not free, paid, not paid. Yeah. Having it's a true. tribe and it's having true. a community of yeah. that size, regardless of the money now, money later, what else they're going to buy, customer lifetime value, all that good stuff. That is a huge, huge accomplishment. So is the association an official like 501c6 membership association or it's not? We are not a nonprofit. And to be honest, I dread shifting into nonprofit status because all I've heard from everyone I know who's involved in a nonprofit is it's full of headaches. Sure. So we haven't gone there yet. It's something I think about, but right now I just don't see the need. So legally... We can use that word association totally regardless of for-profit or nonprofit status. Absolutely. Yeah, it's a business. We don't pretend that we're a nonprofit. Sure. Uh, and that's very clear in all our disclaimers. So people listening right now, if they don't have this idea in their heads, why don't you and I plant this? Whatever industry you serve or you want to become at the center of, start your own association. 100%. Go start an association. And by the way, hold an online conference. I don't know why more industries aren't doing this. I can reach a global audience with a teleseminar or webinar-based multi-day events that generates income, that educates and builds our community. I mean, I do not understand why every person who wants to be an influencer isn't doing this in their industry. Because they haven't heard this interview yet, but they (laughs) will now. They're going to go do this right now. So let's talk about the latest and greatest thing, and then we can kind of backfill and talk about some other fun stuff too. The nonfiction book publishing plan, the nonfiction book marketing plan. Tell us about what's going on with these fabulous books. Thank you. Yes. So nonfiction book publishing plan just came out within the last week or two. It's all about the self-publishing journey. How do you self-publish your book in the most professional way possible? So it takes you through step-by-step, avoid a lot of those mistakes that new authors make. Self-publishing can be a very overwhelming thing to do. People don't realize how much is actually involved. So we literally take you through step-by-step. We've also included a chapter on traditional publishing since that is the goal for some people, but the vast majority are self-publishing right now. And I just really wanted to arm people with the tools to do that in the most professional way. The book prior to that was the nonfiction book marketing plan that came out in 2013. Still 95% of it is relevant today as it was then. You know, not much has changed. Even social media, it shifts and maybe Instagram is new, but Facebook was here, Twitter was here. You know, that not a lot has changed there. You and I had this conversation many years ago about the term a real publisher, yeah. right? It's like, oh no, it's my book is with a real publisher, some of these traditionally published authors would say. Having done eight self-published books myself and now working on my second traditionally published books, believe me, the self-publishing is way the heck more real because you do way the heck more work. Yeah. Uh, but let's talk about what are the pros and cons today? I mean, when I when people ask me, like my speaker clients, for example, well, should I go this way or that way? And I'm no publishing expert, but my perception is the three big challenges, and maybe there's some clever ways to overcome them with self-publishing. One is distribution. Two is access to major media book reviews. And then three is the ability to get foreign translations. Other than that, self-publishing has it hands down for a whole bunch of other reasons. But walk us through how do you coach your members and your clients when they're making this decision? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I personally chose to leave traditional publishing because as a type A control freak, I did not like the lack of control. And honestly, my third book with the traditional publisher, my final straw was when they called literally right before we went to press and they said, we want you to remove a chapter. We don't care which one, but we want to cut costs. And as you know, that's like pennies to cut pages out of a book. It's pennies out of a traditional black and white interior paperback. It's stupid. So that was the culmination of a bunch of big frustrations for me in traditional publishing. You know, on average, you're going to earn a dollar a book. You're doing the bulk of the marketing work anyway. It's a huge myth. A lot of authors will say, I just want a traditional publisher to pick it up so I don't have to do the marketing. 
Well, you know, don't rest on that because that is not at all what happens. I know you've experienced that too. You might get a little, little, tiny little bump. And yes, they can probably get you into bookstores. Doesn't mean you're going to stay in bookstores either. So they put your book into bookstores. If it doesn't move in two months, that bookstore ships them all back. You know, and you may get a book advance. You might get five or 10 grand right now. The, you know, it's a pretty much lower market. You don't see another diamond tube earn that back a dollar at a time. So traditional publishing to me is incredibly frustrating. And with self-publishing, you have a lot more control. It is harder to get bookstore distribution. It is not impossible. You can work with an independent distributor to get your books into bookstores, hospital, gift shops, you know, libraries, all kinds of other non-bookstore options too. But let's be realistic. Book sales are primarily happening online anyway. And if you have a niche book, I was just talking with a member of our community this morning. She's got a book specifically for attorneys. Well, you know, that's not a broad audience. Who cares if you get bookstore placement? That book's never going to, you know, get a giant audience in a bookstore. Go online, put your effort into finding your audience online because that's where we all are. Did I just go on a total tangent? Does that? No, no, that was great. That was great. But <laughs> let's also go down the path of, um, you know, a lot of speakers. I'm not sure if it's any value to them, but they like the status of, oh, my book was translated into 10 languages. Yeah. Or they want to speak globally. They want to speak in Dubai. They want to speak in Europe. They want to speak in Asia. They want to speak in whatever, Turkey, Brazil. I mentioned those because my book is both in Turkish and in Portuguese, which is like, it's never like the regular languages, pardon my French. It's never like, oh, Spanish, Italian. No, no, no. It's Chinese. It's Arabic. It's Russian. Like, what is that? Wow. My book is in six languages. None of my self-published books, I wouldn't even know where to begin to get translations. Is that a thing or what is that? It It is absolutely a thing. You can absolutely sell your own foreign rights. There are foreign rights agents out there. There's a, a gentleman by the name of Bob Erdman. That's all he does is a full-time foreign rights agent. And as a self-published author, you can 100% pursue foreign rights. And by the way, right now, audiobooks are exploding. You can go produce your own audiobook with ACX or Find Away Voices. So, you know, self-publishing options are getting bigger and bigger every day. That's amazing. You know, I'm going to send a book to a CEO, right? This is the old thinking. I'm going to send a book to the CEO. CEO is going to want to look for HarperCollins, Wiley, Portfolio. They're going to want to see that logo on the spine. If I send them a self-published book, they're going to go, oh, this guy's not serious. This gal's not serious. True, false. What are the shades of gray on that one? I think that has changed a lot. I think that those of us who are in the industry are more cognizant of who published a book than your typical company executive who's not even paying attention. And if you produce a book that looks like it came from a random house or a big five publisher, nobody's going to care. Your traditional media cares. There's still some stigma there. But uh, your typical corporate executive, I work with people every day that are consultants and speakers and they're sending their books out to get business and they're getting business and they're getting booked as speakers. It's a big thing. You know, speakers sell books. Every speaker needs a book. And then the other huge plus, of course, for self-publishing is just book sale profits, right? If the book costs three, four dollars to print and the cover price is 20 bucks and you cut them a deal saying, hey, you want to buy 300 books for $15, right? You're getting a check for $4,500 and you're spending 900 bucks on printing. You just made an extra $3,600. And that's a huge part of revenue for a lot of speakers that I've worked with over the years. You know, and as a publisher myself, we work with speakers and we drop shit books all the time for speakers. And that is, if you know, you take a lower fee for an engagement because you have to work with the budget. And then you say, but I'm going to sell books at the back of the room. And they say, great. And you can sell another hundred copies and leave there with, like you said, a couple grand in your pocket. That helps make up for that lower fee. So 100% is a great strategy. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit, because you put an awful lot of work into this big, huge, you call it a conference. I guess most people would call it an online summit. Is that the same kind of business model? Yes. No, I don't like the word summit because the summits are usually free. We're not free. You know, the vision has always been to take the traditional writers conference and put it online. And I speak at a ton of writers conferences. So 
you know, we've got it's a high content. There's no sales pitch. You know, that's one of the messages to our speakers. At the end, you can give your bio, you can, you know, lightly mention what you do. But these summits are built on the premise that, yeah, I'll be a speaker for you. But at the end, I'm going to give some five minute pitch about what you can buy. And that's just not part of how I want to operate. So it's not how we're doing it. And what we find, even with our weekly teleseminar series, that if the audience is engaged and they like what you've just had to say, and you softly mention, I offer this service or that program and your website, every speaker we have tells me, I heard from people who were listening to that program because they like to, and they probably like the fact that they're not getting a cheesy pitch at the end of it. So I really try to stay away from the word summit. That's kind of a pain point for me. It's the S word. It's the S word. It's the S word. We don't use that word anymore. Okay. No, I love that. Well, and it's also a little bit more prestige and a little bit more like a real in-person conference if we stop using the online lingo and start using the lingo that we're all familiar with, you know, the conference. That's right. And it's still an inexpensive entry point. Our fee starts at $100. It depends on if you want recordings and transcripts, there's more of a fee. We also do an Ask a Pro session. So, you know, if you go to a live conference and you can sign up to spend 15 minutes with experts and hit them with your questions, we facilitate all of that by phone or Skype. So we try to bring the same benefits you would get at an in-person event online. It's more affordable. You don't have to travel, you know, and it's not a big cheesy sales pitch after sales pitch. It's really rich in content. Right, exactly. And you wouldn't even have to put pants on if you don't want to. No, who needs pants? Exactly, exactly. What a great episode. Wowza. Tell you what, if you want to ramp up your revenue as an expert who speaks professionally, you should really check out our free online training at doitmarketing.com slash webinar. So there's, I mean, we could talk about this for hours and hours and we probably will, but just not in front of everybody else. Talk about this fabulous meetup thing that you've created because you are masterful. You will create bigger communities, both online and offline, than many full-time like trade and professional associations that serve these same people. In fact, now, of course, you have the association, but you had this gigantic like speaker meetup around Sacramento, right? Yeah, it's kind of a happy accident. About 10 years ago, I wanted to network with other speakers in Sacramento. We don't have an NSA chapter here. Our closest one is two hours away in the Bay Area. So I literally on a whim started a meetup group called the Sacramento Speakers Network. We met in a Starbucks for our first meeting. There were four people. The following month, we went to a yogurt shop. There were seven people. And then the story goes on and on, right? So at our peak, we were averaging about 100 attendees per meeting, monthly meeting. What I didn't realize, honestly, it was never my intention to make that a business tool. I honestly just wanted to network and know other speakers and support each other. And it turned into an incredible business tool because I'm an online marketer. My focus has always been online. And you forget that you've got this huge community in your own backyard, right? So I got business because of it. I got speaking engagements, media coverage. Every local media outlet has covered our group in one form or another. The business journals wrote about us a number of times. We've been on the evening news, just all kinds of stuff. Benefits I never intended to happen. So it grew into the largest business-based meetup group in Sacramento. And after my husband died and my life kind of imploded, I eventually gave the group up because it wasn't really aligned with where my focus has been going with building this author community. I needed to kind of reassess my priorities and what was taking my time. And I became a single mom all of a sudden. So I gave the group away. It's still running. It's operating kind of on a different premise than I ran it on. But uh, such power in building a tribe, right, David? I mean, it was never even my intention to have 2,000 members in my own backyard. And it was a total blast to build that. Wasn't the list even bigger at some point? Like not the attendance, but wasn't your overall database like near 3,000 at some point? Yeah, it got up into the mid twos. I honestly, I'm so bad at remembering numbers. It was in that neighborhood and it was a total word of mouth thing. Yeah. Where people would come to the meeting and they would say, three friends told me I had to come to this meeting. And it's just kind of had took on a life of its own. And I think it's harder today to build groups like that because there's so much competition and we have event fatigue. And as the Nonfiction Authors Association, we've got chapters meeting all over the country. We've got a chapter happening in the UK. We've had one in Canada that we lost the Canada group leader, but you know, we've got these chapters and it's harder to get people to show up to in-person events. You know, that has been a huge struggle for us, but 
you know, anybody who's in Dallas or Boise, we've got some pretty hopping chapter. North Carolina's hopping right now. But it's hard to get those in-person meetings going. But once you do, man, it's so much fun. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, let me also, we're just going to hop, skip and jump to something else now. I know that with this latest book, with the nonfiction book publishing plan, you had a fabulous co-author, Carl. Yeah. How was the whole co-authoring process? Because that can be a whole separate kettle of fish, even with the world's nicest, most generous, most wonderful co-author. It ain't your rodeo 100% anymore. And how did that collaboration work? Or how did you find it different than writing the book solo? I love this question. So let me tell you, Carl Palchuk has been a dear friend and a mastermind partner of mine for many years. He I is like the way that you put that already in the past tense. Well, I mean, yeah. We, no, no, he like, was a good friend and then we wrote friend. this book. <laughs> and then we wrote this book. <laughs> and then we wrote this book. So what happened was, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, he kind of puked out a book on how to publish your book. He did it on an airplane because like so many of us, he had friends in his IT community saying, oh, do I do a book, right? Right. So he kind of threw this book together. It's never been his focus, his audience. It was just kind of something that was floating out there and not a primary focus. And I said to him, look, that book's pretty old at this point. You're obviously not really working on selling it. What if you gave me the manuscript? I put my spin on it and update it to what's going on today. And we co, you know, author this book together. And he's like, go for it. He emailed it to me. I'm not kidding. It was like this easy. He emailed it to me. A lot has changed since he wrote that book. There's Create Space and KDP and all this crap that's evolved. So I basically reworked it. I actually ended up reworking probably 75% of it because we also have different tones and styles. And he knows this is my audience, not his. And God bless him. He's like, go for it. Just do whatever you want. I did it. He's really good at all the technical pieces to get your ISBN and register with your copyright. And so I kept all of that intact and I sent it off to him when I was done with it. And I think he changed like two paragraphs and it was his own piece. And then he said, just put it out in the world, just do it. And it was a smoking deal. And let me tell you what a great guy Carl is. He said, I didn't even want the royalties from this book. He doesn't want to be paid for this book because it's not his audience. He loves having his name on another book. He's using it for some PR purposes for his own reasons, but it's my book effectively with my great friend, Carl, you know, and it was super fun to finally find a reason to work together. So I got lucky. I've never wanted to have a co-author before. And I'm not sure in the traditional sense that I would be anxious to do that because I hear what you're saying. Yeah, no, it can be a nightmare. Uh, yeah. Any kind of partnership, not just writing, but any sort of partnership can be 100%. a percent Type a, a loner right here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to also, let me go back to one of the bullets because one as I'm looking over here at the webpage for the nonfiction book publishing plan, Write your manuscript faster than you ever thought possible. And what are some tricks and tips to get it out of our head and onto paper without making it like a massively painful experience? Yeah, I think so many people who haven't done it before think it sounds like an enormous undertaking. So my approach has always been to use the old storyboard method where you kind of get a stack of three by five cards and you put every minor detail of topic of anything you want to cover on an individual card. And that might take you a day to do the brain dump. It might take you a couple of weeks to gather your notes. And then you get them all in individual cards and you spread them out on a floor or a table or whatever. And you start putting those in order and those become your chapters. You can see, oh wait, this has got way too much content. I need to split it into two or three chapters. And that becomes your outline that you work from. And so, you know, don't write without an outline, please. Please don't do that because you've got to have a map to where you're going right? You have to know who your target audience is. You have to be writing for them and you've got to have a path so that it, it's organized and cohesive. So once you have your outline, I take it bit by bit. I treat my nonfiction as if I'm writing a hundred short articles. And honestly, I think that's the way we prefer to read. We're in a very short attention span society. So take it in bits and pieces. And here's another thing, David, that I love to point out to new people who haven't done this before. The average business book manuscript is about 60,000 words. 1,000 words is about three typed pages. Could you get up an hour early every morning and write three pages and do that for the next 60 days? I mean, you would have a manuscript in 60 days. It can be 
so much easier than you think it will be if you break it into those little bite-sized pieces. I love what you said about the hundred short little chapters, right? hundred short little bites. If you do it that way, and I'm assuming that we're going to hire an editor at some always, point. Always. I know. Don't tell the old David Newman. But <laughs> I'll tell you, as soon as you work with a professional editor, like I've got Chris Murray, who's done a fantastic job with both of my books, you'll never go back. You will never. <laughs> oh, I don't need an editor. I'm going to edit this myself. Don't be an idiot right? Don't be an idiot. So my point was, let's say there are 100 articles, blog posts, brain dumps, a 6 a.m., three page, little, you know, boom, boom, boom. Is it important to write them in sequence or can you write them in just sort of random order? Follow your cards. I mean, follow your storyboard. But if I feel like I'm going to write card number 67 today and tomorrow I'm going to write card number 54 and I'm going to go back and write card number three, is that okay or will that screw me up? Heck yeah, especially if you're not writing a memoir or something that needs to go in a very chronological order. Most of us are writing business type books, then, you know, why not jump around? I absolutely do it myself. Here's another thing blog that book. So, whenever I am writing a book, I first go back to my blog and I pull content I've previously written and I rework it for the book. Nobody reads a blog from beginning to end. And even if they did, they're still going to buy your book. So, you know, why not outline the book you want to write and then start also putting pieces of that up on your blog and building your platform at the same time? Every one of us should be doing that because I still firmly believe blogging is one of your best content marketing opportunities out there. I really do. For sure. Now, you have these companion books that are five or six years apart. And I know that if you look at any like big famous name, nonfiction business book author, whether that's Brian Tracy, Jack Canfield, you know, you name your favorite guru, Tom Peters, whomever, there's a lot of repetition. So what do you think about reusing or reframing or repurposing things that if you've written, like, for example, in the nonfiction book marketing plan, even though the emphasis now is on writing and publishing, not marketing, did you find yourself going back and dipping in or even referring to that previous companion book? And then what about the rest of us that might already have a couple books under our belt and we're really tempted to repurpose or reframe or reuse something from our previous book because it's still relevant, but it's like, I've said that before. Yeah, I don't think that's a problem. And and I worry about that too, because you know I've been kind of covering the same topics for a decade now. Um, and there's no question I repeat myself. And and also at some point you kind of run out of new content. You you got to take a new spin on an old topic. And and so I my experience is this. People will certainly, if they've read your previous books, they might notice similar concepts. As long as you're getting enough new, fresh, juicy content in there, they love it. And I've actually had those conversations with my readers. You know, I heard some of the same stuff from your own, your niche book, but you had so much new stuff. And it also helped me re-remember that I needed to remember those points from the previous book, right? So, and it's the same thing when we're speaking, right? You can tell people how to do something and maybe you want them to also hire you as a consultant and you think, well, if I give it all away in my speech, they won't hire me. Or if I give it all away in my book, they won't hire me. You couldn't be further from the truth because I find it's actually the opposite. Give it all away in the book, give it all away in your speech. Nobody wants to implement this stuff themselves. They still want their hands held. They still want it done for them. So, you know, don't hold back. Give all your best content. Repeat bits and pieces of what you've said before. And you're only going to endear yourself to your audience. Absolutely right. Well, and this, of course, comes from the world of cookbooks, right? You go to a famous restaurant, they have a cookbook. You have every single recipe, but that doesn't make you a chef. Heck no. And it doesn't mean you're not going to go back to that restaurant for your favorite dish. You're not going to go home and cook it. I can't duplicate that. Exactly right. Well, so let me ask you, what's next? I know that we're still riding on the huge wave of success of the nonfiction book publishing plan. The association is rocking and rolling. There is all kinds of great things happening now. Is there a secret project? Is there something (laughs) under wraps that we can maybe debut here on the show? There may or may not be another book in the works. That oh, may or come may on. Not- now, with you, there's always another book in the works. <laughs> All right. It took me five years between books. That's like unheard of. I used to get out a book a year, so I kind of got my writing bug back. But it may or may not have to do 
with revenue streams for author speakers, consultants, right? That's Very nice. Audience. It's also where I kind of built my credibility when I wrote From Entrepreneur to Infopreneur that came out in 2006. And that was all about digital revenue streams. And it was kind of a trailblazing book. I finally got the rights back to that book from Wiley. And I don't know that I'm going to re-release it as that book, but there's a, maybe a newer, brighter, more exciting version of that with some previously discussed topics, you know, brought back into a fresh perspective. Well, and then you also have, I'm not going to get up from my desk now, but I'm pretty sure it's over there on the bookshelf. You've got the 100 ways oh, to make yeah. money from your small business. What's the one I'm thinking of? I had 101 ways to grow your business. That's it. Called- yeah. But so that like the revenue stream for authors, speakers, and experts might be borrowing a little bit from that and reframing it and refreshing it. Yeah. That was more about business process. And I got to tell you a funny story about that book. That was a traditionally published book and it never sold well. It was reviewed well, but it never sold well. But that book got me a six figure corporate sponsorship contract. Wow. When I talk to authors about don't focus on making money off that book, focus on all the opportunities you create around that book. Because if I had put all my stock in how well that book sold, I'd be crying in my beer, right? (laughs) But that book landed me a huge six-figure corporate sponsorship deal that was phenomenal and a ton of fun. So you just never know what kind of opportunities books are going to bring you. So let's talk about this. And I'm not sure I'd love to hear about that sponsorship deal, but a lot of times you hear about sponsored books, right? Where it's like, let's put a custom cover on the book, a letter from the CEO, a big gold seal on the front that says gift of the XYZ Plumbing Association. And we're going to buy 3000 books, Stephanie, and we're going to give them out at our conference. We're going to put them in the goodie bag or whatever. What kind of sponsorships are possible built around your book? So sponsors care about your audience, right? Your platform. This is such a buzzword in the writing community. So if you can show a sponsor that you are reaching their target audience, in my case, it was a combination of a high traffic website, a mailing list and a social media presence, and then the book that gives you the authority right? Authority starts with the word author. And so it was kind of a combination. If you can bring that package of assets to a company, you know, let's say you write about women's issues, like a hot topic right now, right? And you're building an audience of women who are trailblazers. And maybe you go and you pitch to Dove, the women's product company. And you say, I've got this huge audience. Let's work together. Let's create a video program. Let's do some sort of campaign. I have worked with a ton of sponsors. I've been paid to write blog posts for the sponsor sites. I was paid $1,000 a month by a credit card company to sponsor blog posts on my own site, one post a month. You get paid webinars, paid Twitter chats, video interviews like this. That six-figure deal involved three trips to the Midwest to speak. I think I did two webinars. I did maybe a dozen blog posts. It was an absolute blast. Oh, and I did a media tour where I showed up in a hotel room at four in the morning and I did 22 media interviews before breakfast, including CBS Market Watch on behalf of the company. So, you know, don't forget that sponsorship's a huge opportunity for those of us who are building an audience. It's, it's a great motivator. And 2018, 2019, the immediate forecast, sponsorships up, sponsorships down, easier to get than before, harder to get than before. We hear a lot about influencer marketing. Is this becoming like a much more prevalent thing? I think it's always been prevalent, but people just weren't as aware of it. It's been happening. Look at the YouTubers who are making millions of dollars, right? They're making millions of dollars because they're influencers. They have an audience. That is the model to follow. And if you've got like a really a niche audience, that can actually work in your favor. My friend, Carl, my co-author, he works with IT companies computer companies. It's a teeny tiny little niche. And he's got huge sponsorships of the tech companies that want to reach his audience. So, you know, a tiny niche, you don't have to have millions of followers necessarily to get these kinds of gigs. They're totally available to you. I find that it's harder to go and get their attention So to me, that's where the content marketing piece comes in. You want them finding you. I just yesterday had a great conversation with a huge potential sponsor of the association. They came to us. They said, we've had our eye on you for a while. And I have this opportunity to send over a proposal with eight different ways we can work together, right? At different price points. That's what you want. You want them coming to you. 
Totally love that. All right. Well, I'm going to ask you two final questions. The final, final question will be how can people get connected and stay connected to your fabulous empire? But even before we get to that, if people were to take one central idea from our conversation today, what would you hope that would be? Build your platform. Honestly, I mean, it's it's a kind of a tired statement, but it's true. If you want these opportunities, if you want sponsors coming to you, I'm doing a speaking gig tomorrow, paid gig tomorrow, David. And I'm not doing a ton of paid speaking anymore. My focus has really shifted to writers and I don't like to travel like I used to. I'm a single mom. I got a paid speaking gig at an association that's having their conference in my own backyard of legal professionals. And guess how they found me? Because they Googled Sacramento speaker content marketing. Go build your platform, optimize your website, make sure you're blogging, make sure you have a social media audience. You know, people don't realize Twitter, for example, you don't have to be on Twitter every day. Twitter is a traffic driver. Put all your blog posts and your videos and your podcasts up on Twitter and you're going to get traffic. Monitor the results. You know, content marketing works. It may be an old piece of advice, but it's the piece of advice because it works. I've built my entire career on marketing online. Buildyourplatform.com, people. <laughs> all That's right. the message. All right, <laughs> Stephanie Chandler, how do people get connected and stay connected and opt into your world and come to the next conference with pants, without pants? How do they get your book? Fill us in on everything. And we're also going to put this in the show notes so people can just click right through when they look at this episode at thespeakingshow.com. Thank you so much. Yeah, nonfictionwritersconference.com. We have our fall event, November 8th and 9th. Our theme is become a profitable author. I'm really excited to interview a seven-figure author. He's got a self-publishing company and they're doing seven figures. It's insane. But we have eight really cool speakers coming. And then of course, Nonfiction Authors Association would love to have you as part of our tribe. We're doing weekly educational events like this one. And I just think we have an amazing group of people who want to make a difference in the world. That part of nonfiction really inspires me. You can also find Nonfiction Book Publishing Plan through Amazon. If you find it, link to it through nonfictionauthorsassociation.com. We're doing a huge you know, promotion right now. You get free downloads. You get entered in our contest to win membership in the association. Conference passes. We're giving away like $3,000 worth of prizes. But you know, I say that low hype. Go get the book. I'm really proud of it. I think that it's loaded with great content. And I'd love to hear from anybody who heard this. You can email me, nonfictionassociation at gmail. Com. That will get me directly. I'm happy to answer questions. Tremendous. Tremendous, tremendous. Well, we have to have you back. We have to have I'd you love back to come on the show, anytime. catch up with your adventures. You and I are going to turn off the microphone, turn off the camera. We're going to have a little coffee clatch here, catch up on whatever. And uh, so fantastic to have you on the show. Thank you so much for having me, David. This was fun. <laughs> Well, that wraps up another episode of The Speaking Show. Hey, tell you what, if you like us, rate us and review us on iTunes. Subscribe, tell a friend. Go grab the notes and downloads and extras at thespeakingshow.com. See you next time. 